Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Habitat Update episode 4, the podcast about entrepreneurship, startups and in general the Japanese market, based in and a little bit focusing on the Kansai area, but we cover global topics as well. The podcast goes live every two weeks as video on YouTube and as an audio only on SoundCloud and uh, Apple Podcast. My name is Tugi, here with me today, Sabrina. Hello, Sabrina. Hello, Tugi. How are you? I'm great. Great? And I also have good news today. Oh, once more you have good news. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. Right, amazing. Well, then let's jump straight right in, right? I mean, I was looking for topics to talk, news to cover, but there's not much around. Um, one thing I can always bring is the my SoundCloud issue. Uh, I just want to mention it once more. We are posting the audio-only version. This is only about the audio-only version. We are hosting it on SoundCloud. This is the fourth episode. Uh, after this, I will start removing uh, later episodes for, like from the other end. So, with number five, uh, the first pet episode will be gone. But that's only SoundCloud and iTunes. You can always see, watch, and rewatch on YouTube. That's one thing. And then let's move on. One other thing got me a little bit upset <laughs> this week in the news. I was like, you know, you don't hear much in, 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 uh, in Western news about startups in Japan and people complain, oh, there's not much. We don't hear anything. That's one reason why we are doing this now. Yes. And then you saw this. Oh, DMM is in the news. And it says... Billionaire porn king reinvents himself as Japan's startup guru. And as I said, it's about DMM. DMM is like a commerce, entertainment, and all sorts of company. But what they also have is a startup branch. Yes, they are a startup accelerator. And they are not an accelerator. I would say they are makerspace and support startups. Well, yeah, online they described as an incubation space. But yeah, as you said, it's a makerspace. And they also have uh, uh, operations in, in Africa, actually, mm -hmm. supporting entrepreneurs there as well. Yes, that's a very interesting operation, by the way. So you, you've visited them before, right? Um, I've yeah, visited yeah. both offices, both the DMM Akiba, that is the maker's uh, space, and also the main office in uh, uh, the DMM brand that has different kinds of startups. So they have two different uh, operations focused on software and hardware okay so different yeah the, different. the 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 main office the dmm headquarters is located in Ropongi. Oh, okay and the, the other one the, the makers one is in akihabara i visited the makers one i just recently joined the i guess i mentioned it even here a demo demo day uh it was very interesting. It's a yeah. really fancy space. The DMM challenge. Yes. Yeah, but the other one, the, the headquarter is even more fancy. Oh my god. However, coming back to this article, now you heard, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot going on. DMM make the brand, the startup brand, the startup branch of DMM is doing quite some interesting things. About, and they mentioned startup in the title of this article, but then the whole, like, I don't know how many words this thing has. It's a huge... Thing, only talking about about how the founder is uh, was in the porn industry uh, as, as like a make, make a distributor and how he made money and what he does with his money and that he's a businessman and whatever and basically it's just a bait for people like us to see like oh finally you know, it's so a lot fun. about his personality um, but recently, he's been involved with a lot of real startups doing some cool work. So That's I think what I mean. They don't mention it. Yeah, they could have focus on that, but... I feel like there's no single word, like, really. Anyway, let's uh, move to something else. Let's move to something interesting and something a bit more uplifting. Namely, we, have, uh, we had news about a Japanese startup getting quite some funding and its hardware. Wow. Uh, let me need the news I have here on the bridge. Dot Japan. It's about ambient te intelligence technology, and uh, they have an underwater drone. Oh yeah, and I've heard of them. Heard of them? And it says, let me quote real quick: Ambient intelligence technology, a Japanese startup developing and manufacturing underwater drones 
announced that it has fundraised 100 million yen, about 1.7 million dollars, in the latest round. And the company intends to accelerate the spread of business use drones for maintaining and managing underwater infrastructure. It's very interesting for bonds. Yeah, very unique. I haven't heard of many Japanese startups developing drones. Well, I mean, the underwater ones or the air ones? In general. <laughs> but yeah, and I like what I like about this one is it's actually tackling uh, an issue we have. Yeah. Whereas the uh, flying drones are more, often more towards consumer electronics, like oh, cameras, oh, racing, oh, whatever. But this one is like really trying to solve something that is probably uh, out there to be solved. Yeah, that's very interesting, and I'm glad that who who funded who's the company behind it. Well, it says next round. Sumitomo. Sumitomo. Next round. Yeah, Mitsu Sumitomo. Hey, Mitsu Sumitomo Insurance. And SMBC. SMBC Venture Capital, capital and investment. Free Bit Investments. Interesting. So Mitsu Sumitomo. Oh, okay. SMBC. Is it two big groups? Yeah. I mean, behind the investment, so. Hopefully they will succeed and they will turn into a case of a, maybe the next Japanese unicorn. Who knows? Mm. You think? I, people usually tend not to push such startups into unicorn states because they are not really very public or like of public interest, no? Mm. <clears throat> I, I would say it depends. It depends mm. on how they will... No, there are some examples, of yeah, course. Yeah, they will shape their business plan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, another news for uh, that might be interesting for entrepreneurs and for companies here in Japan is that uh, three of the bigger telecom uh, companies are starting to offer or want to offer their IoT services. Mm, which one? Uh, let me read it here. Like Japan's top three quotes: Japan's top three mobile carriers will roll out affordable telecommunications services next year to power the Internet of Things for corporations seeking to boost their competitive advantage. And end quote: We are talking about NTT Docomo, KDDI, and SoftBank. Of course, SoftBank is everywhere these days. And another company started similar IoT services. Last year, actually, was Kyocera, mm -hmm. Kyocera Communication Systems. From Kyoto? Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, well, this is an opportunity, it's good, they try, they apply new technologies, although they didn't mention what kind of, it's probably something in-house, I don't know. But, yeah, I think it's, 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 on, it's in time, uh, it's about time that, like, we need some... Uh, Advancement mm -hmm. in the manufacturing and the general business optimization area and to but catch think, up with the world. No? I think Japan is is uh, has a lot of pressure uh, concerning the Olympics. Yes. So then the the two thousand nineteen Rugby World Cup plus the two thousand twenty um, Olympics are the two main events behind all this move. Mm. And there's a high expectation. I think from uh, uh, the global audience that what Japan will show in terms of new technologies and IoT, it's really going on everywhere else. I think Japan is a little bit behind, so it's, it's about time to catch up. Okay. Um, speaking of SoftBank, as I said, they are everywhere with all kinds of news. One of them was uh, that they invested about $4.4 billion? into WeWork, the co-working, global co-working space company. Amazing. That's a huge sum and about 1.3 billion of that was is meant for their expansion into Asia, I means China, I think Korea and Japan. And these are huge, large numbers. Yeah, and they are, um, they are not even developing any, you know, you, you would hear SoftBank investing in companies develop semiconductors yeah. or anything more technology based. Totally unrelated, yeah. I think that's an interesting move to show uh, that Japan is more and more, or at least the main Japanese investor, that is Masatoshi Son, he's moving towards uh, different areas, not only the technology uh, field where he's originally uh, invested, but now he's trying to catch up with other trends and I think Airbnb 
and Uber. Uh, Uber still has some technology, but it's not the core. The core mm. is service. So then it's, I really, I really like this trend and I hope we work and uh, manage to get the, the proper support to enter the Japanese market. Yeah, that's very crucial because... But with SoftBank behind the investment, I don't think that there's going to be SoftBank are not the only ones and it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a foreign company and they don't like people to tell them what to do. Well, they don't necessarily listen. I, I, I'm sure they are aware that the, the Chinese and Japanese market and Asian markets in general have a very unique mm. uh, modus operandi. So then they either adapt or they tend to not to, to be accepted. Or they, don't, they go away yeah. again. Yeah, true. Uh, yeah, as you said, that's actually a, quite a strategy and I think it's a good role model in the sense of, I mean, like I'm talking about Sun now investing left and right in different technologies and like kind of diversifying because that's what you do. You don't just bet on one horse mm -hmm. in one area. Anyway, and then let's stay with SoftBank and go over to SoftBank's humi little humanoid service robot, lovely called Peppa. I really like Peppa. You it's like Peppa? I think he's one of the cutest robots, humanoids I've ever seen. You see him everywhere. He's adorable. Children mm. love that, love him, and elderly. So I think he's a cross generational. Uh, yeah, but that's that's what it was developed for, right? As yeah. a service robot, so to take over and uh, some tasks and be loved. That one of the tasks, uh, very popular in the news recently, was like that. Uh, one of those peppers was performing a Buddhist funeral ceremony ceremony. Uh, yeah, I heard it. Yeah, well, I heard well, how does that make you feel? Um, <clears throat> I think it it's it, it really <laughs> it depends. I think it shows how open Japanese are for new technologies. Um, I would say coming from a half Japanese uh, family, I mean my family being one side Japanese. I wouldn't think that my 95 year old grandmother would have be comfortable. Yeah. But I think the new generations are pretty much okay with that. I think that Japan is pretty open. I would say my uncles, I don't think they would be surprised to see such a trend. And, and considering the um, aging of Japanese population, there won't be enough young people in the future to develop many skills and, and, and activities. So it's, it's pretty understandable they are trying new, uh, new options. Mm. I don't know what I would think. It's it's just, just a strange picture. You imagine it's so personal, emotional, and then you have a robot doing this. Yeah. But yeah. on the other hand, I kind of like the aspect where it goes in the sense of, you know, this is now very like over the top. But like it goes in the sense of how oh, it's religion. You can just place a robot there reading the text and you know and doing. And yeah, I it's think a statement. It's but I guess it's not meant in that way, it's just a, my crazy head thinking about this. I think it's just a thin line between what you believe in terms of faith and you yeah. know, who should be uh, allowed to, to play this kind of role, religion, the religion. Um, but I think if the Buddhists are okay with that, I'm not Buddhist, so I cannot say anything. I, yeah. I respect their, their yeah. choice. No, but it's, it's called that. I mean, um, you, I guess, with Mixed Book, I mean, re you retweeted, uh, tweeted something recently about the, well, the population is aging and like autom automation and uh, robots might become uh, very common in, in Japan, especially. They already are in certain um, functions. Uh, so, yeah. Maybe not seen on the streets. Um, Pepper is the main one that you see, but yeah. there are a few others that are, are, have been produced in Japan. But I think for certain, um, I wouldn't say that Buddhist ceremonies are the name, number one, but I think no, no, just, it's just a use case to show, yeah. they just want to show the case. And I think they, they did pretty well because I read in all the international media and I haven't heard much about Japanese uh, companies. Uh, well, unless it's usually negative, they are more focused on negative um, reviews. So that was a good PR for Pepper for sure. Let's... So PR robots hardware. Let's stay in that segment. And uh, I just recently saw this article on Venture Beat, published, written by Benjamin Benjamin Joffe. Joffe? Joffe? I don't know enough French, but 
yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I should, I should maybe know, but however, uh, Benjamin Joffe, of course, uh, from Hux Hardware Accelerator in China, he wrote this very nice article saying, uh, let me quote you, quote, four years ago when the first unicorn count took place, there were 39 startups on the list, only one of them by a hardware company. Today, the world has some 213 unicorns and 18 of those are hardware startups. So hardware is taking on, getting some traction, uh, which is really good, no? Yeah, oh, it's amazing. I think his, his article is, a, is an outcome after the study that Hacks has published recently called Hardware Trends. Yes, Hardware Trends is actually, you yeah. see some pictures here. And yeah, and you can there. see uh, yeah, the, the unicorns and we were mentioned on that, on that uh, on another slide talking about that. Well, there are many hardware startups because there is more money available. There, is, there are more uh, mentors and, and partner supporters trying to take the challenges with the startups. So it's a difficult field. It and is. It takes some time to build expertise. And now we see... Yeah, you know, and, but experience. still you see way more software uh, accelerators than hardware because hardware uh, requires more money, more time and more resources. I mean, you need the, the level of expertise to, to uh, work with a hardware startup. You still have all the challenges of a software startup, but you have the additional manufacturing part. And that's a great point. So hardware startups, entrepreneurs interested in hardware need all the support they can get. And I heard you have some good news to announce. Yeah. Just to do so and su further support. Make yeah, yourself well, there. we are here to announce um, with the support of Kyoto City uh, this Friday, the 1st of se September, we'll host the opening ceremony of the Kyoto Makers Garage. It's the newest maker space in Japan. Wow. Yeah, it's a new hub for the community. We welcome from students to professionals, startups, artists, designers, creators in general. If you're a foreigner, you're just going coming to Japan for a vacation, you would like to check it out, you're welcome. If you're a student, considering what you want to do, come and talk to us. And we are trying to organize workshops, uh, hackathons, events with uh, corporates and also with students, schools and startups. We are talking with international um, mentors and people who mm. could add value to our community. Mm. Uh, until now, we've been working here at FVC Match, a great co-working space cent central located in Kyoto. But as we are having more startups, we are hosting for startups, we need a space for them to be uh, out. How is the space, how is the situation with makerspaces here in Kansai? Do you have an overview, you know that? Uh, there are a few, I would say that uh, they have machines. There's one in Osaka, a brand new one. You have uh, a few co-working spaces that also have machines, but mm -hmm. it's usually basic level. The ones we have there are a little bit better than the basic ones. Uh, and also, you don't have staff who can actually use the machines all the time. Mm -hmm. so some some, you need instructions. Some yeah, are some fab labs with notice. Uh, it's it's not the target. Not many people go to those places to 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 use the the facility in terms of uh, making making something. Uh, our focus is mainly for makers, but we are open to anyone. We would like to invite communities that already are doing meetups or events, workshops, yeah, to come and talk to us. Uh, the more people we get involved, the better we'll be in the space. It's we we are not with the mindset build it and they will come. Actually, we are planning so they will come. Yeah, and actually, I was thinking, ladies and gentlemen, you should watch out for the next Habitat Update Plus episode because, of course, such a lounge is a good opportunity to introduce the makerspace a little bit and talk about about Kyoto and uh, who knows? I don't know. That was maybe a teaser, maybe not. Well, I, I have many topics in works. Yeah, I think we're going to have <laughs> things, a few uh, updates for the next one. Anyway, but that's good. Congratulations. Good to hear. Uh, we need all the support we can get here in Kansai and 
uh, the situation is already much much better than a couple of years ago. Yeah, since we joined here, I see a lot of like, like in general, not just from makers hardware, but that seems like it's rolling, and and uh, rolling. Let's roll over to the scene and to the inhabitants, as I call them, which also kind of like grew and. What do you have there? What's worth mentioning, which was also established maybe in recent times? Yeah. You like to jump over? Yeah, 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 yeah. I tried to bridge it now, it didn't work very well, but like, tell me about inhabitants. So we have <laughs> today, I'd like to talk about two inhabitants. <laughs> One is Startup Cafe Osaka. Startup Cafe Osaka. Yeah, it's a space. Uh, located within the US Osaka University? Yes, it's Kansai, a building. Kansai, 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 Kansai University, building, I'm yeah. sorry. Kansai University, and then there's a Starbucks there, and then in the building you have spaces that can be used for startups, they organize meetups, they invite um, uh, local players to show what they're doing, so mm. I already attended the Plan Robotics uh, meetup. The fan meetup. Fan meetup there. I think you already hosted something there with... Uh, uh, yes, we did the uh, GBH Startup Camp uh, launch kickoff event there. Yeah, so then they are, they are uh, very well connected with their community. It's a great facility, very central located in Umeda, yes. Osaka. So I think it's good to, to mention. And one thing I didn't know, Startup Cafe is a Japan thing. Yeah, I think the first one was in Fukuoka. In Fukuoka, they started in Fukuoka. I just really quick saw that they started in Fukuoka, and uh, I was like, oh, this must be a global thing. They come to Japan, or no? And now they have a Osaka press. I'm sure there's also in Tokyo one. Meanwhile, uh, yeah, what they do is really cool. They provide like also free mentoring basically in workspaces, like within usually within cafes. So it's kind of like an arrangement I think with them to to push there. So that the, the one in Fukuoka was with the Tsutaya, what's it called? Tsutaya. Tsutaya, yeah. yeah book, it's a bookstore, book coffee thing, shop. And here we have it with the Kansai University. And but the, also Tsutaya. And is it Tsutaya as well? Yeah. And the, Starbucks? In, yeah. In the bottom, in the, yeah, it's like a... Yeah, people are talking. No, yeah, we won't say anything about that. Well, it's just it's great. <laughs> we need more spaces like that that are open for startups. I think every university should have a, a known, a more casual space for people from all different courses and faculties to, to meet and to engage. Mm. And that's something that I miss about uh, decentralized universities in general. Things tend to be too spread, each course or a special specialty around its own hub or with a professor. And, and then you don't get what makes startups rich is the diversity. So you only have diversity if you meet. have hubs for them to casually meet. That's actually true. You have usually, and it's just logistically not possible sometimes you have to have everything in one spot of a university. So you have, oh, in this part of the city you have this kind of studies, and here you have these studies, yeah. but they never really meet each other. Yeah. And which and is the crucial thing to do if you want to exchange and cross pollinate. Yeah, that's why also we are launching Kyoto Makers Garage. Mm -hmm. We want to involve all universities, all courses, and. Where is, by the way, where is the Makers Garage located? It's at JR Tambaguchi area Tambaguchi. near Kyoto Research Park. Oh, I understand. Okay, and then let me finish with the last inhabitant for today. I would like to mention the startup from Osaka, Gochso. Gozo, it's a very unique social startup. Mm. They are focused on supporting uh, local business, matching mm. local business with NPOs that already do organize events. So what's the main purpose? Is try to fill in the restaurants in the, uh, the times they are not so busy mm. with uh, an NPO uh, project event. So then anyways, you as a user, you pay through the app, the restaurant will make its money and part of the, the, the money, the donation will go to the NPO. Mm. So I think it's a good match uh, between uh, NPOs and restaurants. Uh, Japan, Japanese, especially in Kansai, are very, very um, 
social, sociable, and they tend to be very like things happen between I don't know Wednesday and Sunday, and then maybe you have like Monday and Tuesdays are usually like not so busy. So they so use that spot, the air, the time to make it uh, something different. They yeah. arrange that the restaurants open up for reservations from Kochiso. Yeah. And it's actually very interesting because most of the times in Japan you anyway make a reservation to go for dinner with more than maybe one person. Yeah, it's really... Um, so it's, it's just a win-win situation. Yeah, kind of restaurants way. usually are smaller than, than in most Western countries and there's not much space. So you yeah. either make a reservation in advance or you don't go. Great! Check out Kochisa everyone. Go online and if you're ever here... Yeah. Japan in Osaka. On if you're Kansai. interested to help and uh, support an NPO, check it out. See what you can do, and join events from them. Um, let's move on then. You said that's the that's the the final one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Not that I interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no. I tend to be a bit. I had uh, too much coffee and I'm very excited and uh, energetic and. Uh, let's move on. Events, and with events, I want to start. Uh, with events we visited. I haven't been to any events in the last two weeks, not that I can remember, but I know you have been, and I know you're eager to tell us about it. <laughs> of course. I'll, I, what's the purpose of going to such an exciting event and not being able to share anything, right? Ten. So I was invited for this specific event organized by McKen, the, uh, mm. McKen Erickson, the uh, ad and company. It's a global group, part of popular through the Mad Inter Men series. Yeah, famous for Mad Men Interpublic Group. It's a, a huge group, and it's McCann has been in Japan for quite a while. I work for McCann in Brazil, and I know some of my friends over there that uh, still work there. Mm -hmm. And the, they have a series of studies um, trying to bring consumers uh, trends. Mm. Size, and it's called Truth Central. Then they already had one of truth, truth about youth, truth about different topics. This time, the, uh, the research is called Truth About Age. And what they mean by age, it's not only focus on elderly or getting old into the point you're retired. Oh. It's about aging. It's like how each generation, each generation, the 20s, the 30s, or the 40s, the 50s, 60s, 70s, how they perceive getting old or aging. How each age group perceives. perceives. That means when you're 20s, yes. how does it feel for you? What does it mean to get, get yes. old? And that's a very interesting uh, uh, concept because what the, the final message is first, when we think about aging, we just think about elderly getting retired, you know. No, it's a topic for everyone, right? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Everyone after their maybe 20 starts to count, the, like, or stops to count the age and when, 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 when the birthday comes around, comes around the corner again. And yeah, and it was amazing <coughs> because they made this um, research uh, with over 24,000 people uh, from Canada, US, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, Sweden, Norway, the UK, France, Spain. Portugal, Finland, Denmark, Hungary, Germany, okay. Turkey, Lebanon, South Africa, India, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, China, Japan, Philippines, and Australia. Why I mentioned that, and they also had other countries involved. What is important to say is they, they try to work with different realities. And the, the final outcome is one, brands and global brands and big companies, including agencies, haven't been able to respond uh, properly to consumers' needs. That means most of those groups feel misrepresented, feel they are not understood, they are not heard. From The brands don't know what they want. What it means, probably that elderly are only seeing the ones who retired, who should stay home. Stereotypes. Yeah, and they don't, they don't break, they, and they are not trying to understand the stereotypes. Mm. So the... They had a very good uh, example. They got real cases of uh, people who gave testimonials about what they feel. I think the part that scared me most was that Japan was uh, with the lowest, uh, I would say, lowest confidence and, and 
hope in, in between the 20s, so uh, the young generation in Japan suffers a lot, but this is not an isolated case for Japan, it's Asia in general. So mm -hmm. in China, a 20-year-old guy said youth is like a prison. That's a very strong state because for me, when I was 20, I was so happy. And I, had, I would see so many opportunities and possibilities. Why did he say youth is like a prison? They because I think that in Asian countries, I think there are very high standards for studies, for achievement. Pressure. Yeah, the so pressure from the society. You have to system. please everyone. And that's something that you show, uh, you, you can see very, very uh, easily compare European uh, uh, yeah. countries with uh, Asians. That was the huge gap. But basically, the four messages they, they gave is start young. That means when you're 20s, you have to start talking to 20-year-old guys about what it means to be old. It doesn't mean that life is gone, you won't be happy anymore. Because the 20s are suffering, thinking that they, when they are 50s, they are going to be unhappy. And that's why they suffer. Mm. Uh, second, celebrate the gains. Actually, consider what's good. See the... Have, uh, have full size of your cup, not only the half empty. Uh, go beyond the number. So, we are not only our age. We are what no. we have in, a, in terms of dream and, and, and so on. And age is just a number. Exactly. And promote intergenerational connections. Yeah. So that's very important, especially in countries where there are so many taboos and yes. the pressure of the society is so big. So I think Japan and Korea for those numbers were uh, not surprisingly quite high. Um, there is this culture of you know uh, hierarchy and elderly being known as to be respected and not questioned and so on. So that's damaging the current generation. So brands with the power of being in the ads in the media should start doing something to question the values. Mm. And I think that that's a very important uh, key. And I think startups have a great opportunity to disrupt exactly how consumers are misunderstood. So they should, because it's, isn't that the, yeah, the word disruption and startups, that's, those are the c companies that try, they risk and come up with new ideas if you have huge companies with a reputation they will never try like to go radical there are exceptions yeah so my main but message for startup is like don't be afraid of trying and uh, there are many people who don't agree with the main brands take advantage that the brands are not understanding consumers and do your homework do your benchmark try to see what people want what your target needs yeah, and this is very, very important. Yeah. Focus on a consumer-oriented... Uh, Don't assume, but go ask. Yeah. And get feedback and adjust and speak to the clients. I like this actually. They, they, so they don't just say, hey, these are these, these age groups. They feel like that. This is how you can make money out of it. You know, they say you have responsibility to break this and to help shaping the future. Yeah, yeah, I think so that it's was not just like, about money making. <laughs> yeah, no, it was way more than that because I think <laughs> it's more about actually delivering something that people are have comfortable with. And if you see, I have noticed in Japan, a female are very misrepresented, elderly, and so on. So I think there's there's a lot of opportunities for a startup. So but if you're a startup, not just startup, everyone should have this in their minds, question things and. Try to be different, you know, in a positive way. Of course. Whatever positive means, it's up to you to define. Anyway, thank you very much. Do you know how often these ha uh, events happen, or do you usually um, see them online? It, it, this, this is, it's not, I would say, every two or three years. So they had already truth okay, about millennials, really about youth, and so on. So, okay. yeah. Because it's a huge study. That's yeah. just the result of the study. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's a brief result, and I think I'm sure you can get the but full I, details. But I think it's important to note that they did the truth about age in Japan, because Japan is the example of a developed country that aging has been treated as a problem. Mm. And no one is focused on the gain of having experience. Mm. 
and they are games. I'm not gonna contradict that. Great, thank you very much. That sounds really cool. Like, uh, I wish I could have joined. Mm. Well, anyway, let's move on. Uh, that's all, I guess, from in terms of events we visited in the last couple of weeks. And then looking forward, I can mention some of the same ones we had last time, but let me just remind you. So, September 1st, this Friday, we have the Kyoto Makers Garage opening ceremony, opening party. And then the next day, September 2, it's the Craft Phone event, same yes. location. Yes. And that's organizing collaboration with the Kyoto Design. Design, uh, yeah. Kyoto. Kyoto design. Not Design Lab. The other, Kyoto Design. Kyoto Design Week. Kyoto Design Week. Too many, too many of these words flying around. Yeah, Kyoto Design Week. Yeah. Anyway, September 2nd, there's a lot going on. September 2nd also, we have the Pecha Kucha Night in Osaka. We have the Pecha Kucha Night in Kyoto. And around the same time, uh, September 1st to 3rd, we have the Startup Weekend in Kyoto. And then, the next week, we have a Startup Weekend in the Startup Cafe in Osaka, we just introduce you to, which is the September 8th to 10th. September 8th is the demo day of the Startup Summer School, the Kyoto Startup Summer School, organized by uh, Design, Kyoto Design Lab, Lab. Kyoto Design Lab in, mm -hmm. at the Kyoto Institute of Technology. And further down the road, September 23rd, we had Code for Japan Summit in Kobe. September 27th to 28th is the Tech in Asia Japan event in, in Tokyo, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, around that time right after that event on September 29th we have Disrupting Japan is celebrating its third anniversary and on the same day we have an event by Blink which is a startup association community uh, not startup a student uh, startup community to connect entrepreneurial students with companies and educate them. It's a pretty new thing and I'm sure we're gonna hear more of them. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on then to uh, <laughs> Habitat Echo, where you write us like fan mails or questions, send us your questions, your feedback, your stories, your inputs. Your doubts. Your doubts, or if you have anything to say about what we just talked. And uh, this week we have Good. <laughs> that, nothing. Like oh, I had some mail, but it was spam. Okay. And although it's it said like oh don't open it, it might be malware and whatever. I still opened it because I was hoping maybe it was you know maybe. But I'll see. Anyway, uh, anything from you, Sabina? No, all good <laughs> no. for today. All good, all good for today, ladies and gentlemen. This has been Habitat Up episode for the podcast about entrepreneurship startups and the Japanese market in general based in focusing on a little bit the Kansai area which uh, covers the cities like Kyoto, Osaka, Kobe and we post every two weeks as a video on YouTube and as an audio only version on SoundCloud and uh, Apple Podcast and that's more or less it writers Thank you very much for joining me. See you soon. See you soon.